Right. Uh, let's start. Sean, take it away for anything breaks. Okay. I'm a little bit hesitant because the, the volume is playing through my computer, but oh yeah, is it can you mute your yeah? I did just mute it, but nothing else is coming through. So if anyone wants to ask questions, I guess it was going through my phone, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. perhaps the way I speak with the chat. Anyway, okay. Sorry about the delays, everybody. Uh, we had some technical problems getting things started. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, boundary recovery of the index of the collection of index parameters for the Panorama differential equations. Um, and uh, I am a bit anxious to give this talk because it is quite mathematical. Uh, and so I apologize in advance for that, but hopefully it's of interest to some people. And if you want to ask questions, I'm happy to stop and try to clarify things along the way. All right. So, uh, uh, and I guess I should add this was really a first of the PhD student, uh, Vasiliki or Vicky, that they got the recently graduated. All right, so <clears throat> we're looking at the uh, time harmonic Maxwell's equations, uh, which are shown here. Uh, yeah, atoms of any current or a metrical source. And uh, what we are interested in recovering is the parameters that appear there, which are epsilon and mu. Parameters. Uh, just to go over the things that are involved in these, this is a system of equations we have E, it's a complex value electrical field, it's time harmonic field. Uh, we have H, this is the uh, magnetic field. We have epsilon, it's called the permittivity, <clears throat> one of the electrical parameters view is the permeability. Uh, omega is the angular frequency, and we'll just assume that omega is a, a fixed angular frequency for the rest of the talk. Uh, <laughs> And uh, again, we call epsilon and mu together the electrical parameters. And the objective is to determine what epsilon and mu are, and it's said from some information about the solution of the H. Determine epsilon and mu from some boundary information, in particular about the name, which I'll describe. So the, in order to study this, this becomes a really a geometric inverse problem. Uh, and so we want to put the equations into a invariant, a coordinate invariant form, uh, which allows us to do analysis without being attached to a particular coordinate system to apply some geometry to this. And uh, the way that you can do that is to change the, the, to this formulation. And the, the difference between these two things is that uh, here we have the curl and the divergence and the linear operations. And here we have uh, the exterior derivative p the cod star, which is the star g, and the, the, uh, the divergent dependence with respect to the metric g, which I'll describe in a moment, and g is the Euclidean metric. And so this agrees with the Euclidean formulation when you use Euclidean coordinates and Euclidean metric, but it's a coordinate invariant. And uh, the exterior you know, just to, you have to help us speak about it in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be matrices. That's what makes it an epic So, yeah, that, that, when we go just discuss this in a geometric context in the invariant form, uh, E and H are differential log forms. G is a Euclidean metric, uh, and we could consider more general metrics, but I want to use, we like this to Euclidean formulation. G should be the Euclidean metric, which might be a different coordinate system. Uh, star G, as I said, is a Hodge star operator. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, it maps one forms to two forms and two forms to one form. So zero forms to three forms and three forms to zero forms. And uh, it's, a, it's kind of like, uh, so it maps, for example, dx1 to dx2 and dx3. It kind of maps with one form to the top and it's complementary rather than two forms. Uh, the divergence. Uh, can be defined in this way. So this agrees with the Euclidean divergence. Uh, where you put the coordinates of the composition of the Hodge star and the exterior derivative gives us the divergence of the set of metrics. Right. And uh, again, the goal is to infer the parameters in a region and uh, for measurements of the tangential components of E and H. So these are the boundary information we have about E and H for particular solutions of this equation. Under uh, region 
Sure. I wonder if it's useful to say that the Hodgstar from one form to two forms is it really can think of it as the way that you go from a, a vector to a skew symmetric matrix. Because, because that's kind of familiar, or at least we've maybe seen that in some other talks. If you have a skew symmetric matrix, it only has three non zero things, different things, I think that's what I'm going to call it. And, and kind of this. There's a way of rearranging a, a vector into a skew symmetric matrix, and, and that is a one form to two form Hodge star. So, and that only helps if people knew that thing about skew symmetric. That's good. Uh, okay. All right. So, this is the goal to produce parameters. Uh, I want a view from the image of the Right. And so uh, the way you can think about this is the tangential component of one field is controlled at the boundary. And then you look at the map from the tangent, that tangential component, which to find the solution of the system of equations to the tangential component of the other, uh, <clears throat> the other field. And this is the way to write this. And so uh, tangential component can be considered as the pullback to the boundary of uh, H. So I is the inclusion of the boundary. In larger set, and then we just consider the full back to the boundary. If, if you, uh, again, aren't sure about this kind of geometric notation, it's just considering the same with the point. So, so, so but, and it's just forced to think, so we think you something like the radio waves at fixed frequency, mm -hmm. so it seems a time harmonic maximum separation. In, in some bounded domain, and we're just, we're like pushing in, a magnetic field and measuring electric field in the boundary. So, yes, that's all right. So, we've got a kind of conceptual experiment with some kind of antennas that we do that. Maybe. So, you have the what are you doing? Well, you can do it either way. So, we either go from electric or from the magnetic field or the other way. <clears throat> and then, so, they're inverses of each other, going from electric to magnetic to magnetic to electric. And so these are the maps we want to consider. We want to assume that we have knowledge of these maps. So if we were to put in any magnetic field, say, uh, then we would get have a tangential component of electric field. You yeah, could do that for many different magnetic fields and then try to determine epsilon u from that example. Okay. And so this kind of goes to thank you. The, Comment the electrical parameters are anisotropic, which is one of the key things. So, this problem has been studied for the isotopic case with epsilon and mu are equal scalars. Uh, with the kind of new thing here, which is in the title, because we thought is that they're anisotropic. So, I just realized Margaret Cheney's online and she wrote the big one that was the isotropic one, right? Probably. Um, so, Uh, right, and the omega is fixed. Right, and so uh, I'm going to discuss now what we mean by anisotropic. So I mentioned the epsilon you are anisotropic. So an easier way, geometric way to say that is that epsilon you are one one tensor fields. So this means they would map one form to one form, for example, which is what they're doing in the, the role in the equation. Right? So epsilon u. Path from P to one, one for P to another one for him. It's a natural way to define these. You can make this for the invariant. And uh, this is what we mean by saying they're anisotropic. So they're isotropic if they're scalars, that would be multiples of the identity that we see in the general than that, they're anisotropic. There is a kind of in-between one, which actually I haven't mentioned here, which has been studied in the past as well, where they're conformal to each other, which is that they're anisotropic but multiple of one another. And so uh, we also are going to assume that uh, epsilon and mu are uh, well, basic assumptions that mu value, um, which is, it doesn't necessarily correspond with all applications, but sometimes you want this to be complex value, but we assume that real value. Smooth, which is the, give me the 
material is it's like smoothly varied and it's a graphic. And the other thing is that they're symmetric, which is a I think a physical assumption with respect to the uh Euclidean metric. And that, that precisely means that if you take the inner product with epsilon or mu, then you can include on the And uh so these are you know, the assumptions you don't have to come to. So we want to recover it at that point of view. Um, the, uh, so uh, the first simplification, or maybe not a simplification, but one, one thing we can do is eliminate G. So I presented these and said we would immediately go from the uh, Formulation involving curls and divergences to this one, which is coordinate invariant, but it involves the Euclidean metric uh, G, as well as the two parameters that form the U. And so you might want to say, I mean, just from measuring the field at the boundary, maybe it's too much to ask that you determine all three of those things. You want to determine maybe two of them. But uh, in fact, what you can do is eliminate G. And you can do that by uh, making a certain transformation to different. Uh, quantities. And so uh, and I think probably this formula is a lot to take in, but there, there's a way that you can make a, that you can change these uh, factors, epsilon and mu, if you're here, it's actually epsilon inverse mu inverse invertible mass, and then epsilon is invertible. Uh, and it, this plant means that we take the corresponding metric to those. And then you make a conformal change, you know, so you multiply them by a factor which depends on their determinant, the determinant and the Euclidean metric. And if you do that, and there's a little bit of algebra you need to check, but that actually eliminates G from this equation, and you get instead the odd star with respect to these new metrics. So the difference here is that this doesn't depend on the inside of the G. And that indicates that probably we're not going to be able to determine. Uh, you know, product, things about the Euclidean metric from these equations, even if they only assume that they're there. I mean, I think it's actually the, the point that the formulation of uh, Maxwell's equations doesn't care about the Euclidean metric anyway. So, it, it just, it, it's not, uh, you know, he wants to make the everything else you got it. There's, there's no way you can find the Euclidean metric in that because it's not even the equation. Well, this is an equation, it's not really a question. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But I mean, it's like that's the intrinsic property of Maxwell. But what I mean is, uh, it's just the way that we write Maxwell's that we use the Euclidean metric. I mean, for that's that's really in the physics, right? I mean, I, I mean, perhaps this is just a derivation of these equations with now no longer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So you can write the equation in such a way that they don't depend on the equation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we need to introduce some notation. Uh, so uh, the the calculations that involve in this get pretty technical, unfortunately. And so uh, I'm just trying to be clear about uh, some of the notations that are used. So we have the Euclidean metric uh, here, which actually isn't really relevant, but and this is the same notation for other metrics. So we have the two metrics which appear here, which correspond to the electrical parameters, which are epsilon hat and mu hat, these two of them are determined because this notation about metrics applies in both of those cases. So G could be either one of those. And so uh, the new standard notation for a metric is a, is a matrix with two indices in the lower position, and that's a, a so called Riemannian metric on the left there. And then and the corresponding uh, metric on covector fields, which is the one where you raise the indices, is the metric on the right hand side. And this one, and this one so actually, in the normal Euclidean, or sorry, Riemannian geometry setting, the, the, in the, the notation with the indices up, so G with the indices up, is inverse matrix of the index. And that's actually an important point because uh, it's. Um, Tensors, like one one tensors, you can either raise the indices using the Euclidean metric or you can lower them. And that's not the same thing that you get from, uh, for example, lowering one of them and then just making it. This is just the same as 
people who have learned their in like old school medicines with indices mm -hmm. rather than the invariant one, just just in case it looks familiar from yeah. some long forgotten journal relativity class or something. Yeah. Okay. So another notation is that we use the like the absolute value of R squared and then you get determinant. Yeah. I mean, this is the same. This important point here is the notation is for a one out of two Okay, uh, and uh, another point which is uh, important is that um, we use this uh, inner product notation for taking the inner product with respect to a metric G of uh, two vectors A and B. And uh, also the norm, and there's no uh, complex conjugate of these. So these are the real inner product in norm, right? You know, the ones that you would use if you only had real vectors. But actually, we deal with complex vectors, meaning, for example, that the this notation, which maybe you would call norm, could be zero. It, it is complex. Were you saying we're like DNA complex because it's not yeah. only we use complex? Uh, and then uh, yeah, I think this appears in some places in the notation that uh, if there's a tilde over the index, no one takes the values from the two. And so we are normally work in coordinates where the third coordinate is the distance to the boundary. So this would be where only considering the coordinates that correspond to the one and the two boundaries. All right, so right, this is a review of the various things which have appeared here. Right? So we in the original equation, we have a, a one one tensor epsilon, the force line thing for you, uh, which has a coordinate expression with one index up and one down. One down. Right, we can do the raising index with respect to say the Euclidean metric of this. We get a two zero tensor of two inches of up. Right, that, that's the coordinate expression that's written there. Uh, there's also a different one where you take the inverse of epsilon and lower an index, the zero two tensor there. And then we have a uh, epsilon hat, which is this one where we take epsilon raise an index and we have to divide by a, a determinant. Right? This is the thing that we did in order to, to, to eliminate G from the equation. And uh, there's an epsilon hat inverse, which is actually as you can see the metric here with the matrix here rather than the inverse of this one. <laughs> It is the same notation. So there's quite a few different kind of versions of this big electrical perimeter floating around. So that's all the notation. I know it's, it's a lot to take in, but uh, that's the end of it. What we need, so I'm going to say. Uh, but I want to present what are the results you actually showed. Don't make so, so much of a reference to the notation. The first one is about the well posedness of Maxwell's system. And so this is just looking at the system of equations and showing that the solution exists for given electrical parameters. So there's a solution of E and H for with specified uh, tangential component of E, uh, provided omega oh, outside of the discrete set. So there's some set of uh, eigenvalues, and then the in which case there's no solution, but then out there that discrete set is a uh, then that's the kind of the forward problem, if you will. At a frequency which isn't one of the uh, resonant frequencies, the forward problem will be proposed. And then there's some natural non uniqueness which occurs, and this occurs commonly in all geometric inverse problems that you're familiar with. The, the, so the transformation, so there, there's a uh, way that you can change the parameters and you have still the same data. So if we have a diffeomorphism, which simply means a smooth map from the set M to itself, which keeps the value of the boundary of M in the same place, so fixes the boundary of M, then you can uh, change the parameters by that diffeomorphism, and it still gives you the same uh, the same boundary. 
lambda epsilon of this map based on the h that we have. Also, they can correct that. This is a standard thing that comes up in the geometric inverse problem. There's one other thing about non uniqueness, uh, which is related to whether or not we could determine uh, the epsilon and mu, the 1 1 tensors. So you might want to say, so this top one is about determining epsilon hat and mu hat is for the things we get when we eliminate mu from the equation. But you might want to say if we can determine these ones, which uh, are the ones that are originally, the 1 1 tensors originally in the equation. And uh, can't determine those, and in fact, so there's this technical thing about the determinant of G, which is like a volume form of the Euclidean metric in every normal coordinates. Okay, so that's the negative, those are the negative results, the positive results. So uh, we can determine the tangential components of epsilon hat and u hat uniquely by. From the principal symbols of these operators. And so the strategy here is to calculate the principal symbols of these operators. If you familiar with it, you know about pseudo differential operators. So that's basically the top order part of these operators. And from that, knowledge we can determine the tangential components. What exactly is meant by the tangential components? Let's go to the actually the part of the operator part of vectors. And so, and then for the non tangential components, um, you can, so ideally, you would say you can go on and determine the non tangential components of the normal component uh, of these boundary maps in some specific coordinates. Uh, but actually, I have to add a, a few additional hypotheses. So it seems that uh, we, we, the strategy is to try to determine the principal symbols of. The uh, operators when the epsilon and the mu, and then from that determine the technological <coughs> uh, parameters. But in fact, there's a lot that are required to do that. And then uh, you can also just think about can you determine all the derivatives of epsilon and mu at the boundary? So that's called the full jet. <coughs> And uh, if you can determine the ten non tangential components, then in fact, you can determine all of the uh, derivatives as well as if anything that's defined. So once you know then on the so the key obstacle obstacle is this uh, additional hypothesis that I'm trying to explain. I mean the question is that often when you see a family study problem like this you start sort of counting numbers of functions mm -hmm. and so you you've got this um tangential eta h map which maps like Maybe like something like two two functions of two variables to another two functions of two variables. Yeah. So the kernel would be that means kernel would would, would be um, like two functions of four variables and something like that. I mean, is is there a kind of dimension counting like that that we can do to say, you know, oh, oh it's it's bound to be underdetermined, so there's some things you can't find or. Uh, so it, it is an, more or less an operator from vectors on the boundary. Vectors on the boundary. Vectors on the boundary. And you have to determine. Oh, but it's coupled, right? So, so it, it, it's a symmetric coupled thing. So maybe three functions of four variables. You know, so you're thinking of a, it's an integral operator. So if you write a variable with a kernel, but that kernel's a, I guess, if you look at the Schwarzschild of the boundary map, mm -hmm. that could be on the boundary plus the boundary. Yeah. But uh, assuming some dimensionality, you know, the thing is uh, let's say three or higher, mm -hmm. then typically this becomes over determined, right? In two in the two dimensions, it becomes common dimensions. Because it's n minus one, so mm -hmm. three dimensions it is four dimensions. N minus one plus n minus one. And so how that the number boundary so that the number. I'm just thinking of it as just map function. Yeah, even for functions, right? On the boundary, mm -hmm. 
the quark is two dimensional if it is in the ambient space of three dimensional. Yeah, so the quark can be four dimensional. It depends on but one function four values, right? But but it's it, it's goes to tangential vectors to tangential vectors. Probably it's symmetric in that so that would be three functions of four values. And we still we're saying it's still sound very continuous. And we're looking for the components of the epsilon and the U on the boundary, right? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I mean, you really need to fix some coordinates. So that the fixing coordinates corresponds with removing the top non unique coordinates. Not from that. If you fix some coordinates in the neighborhood of the boundary, that like. <laughs> In fixed boundary normal coordinates that reduces one of them to four functions, right? Yeah, but uh, is that losing the diffeomorphism in various and fix it? Yeah, um, that's my point. Right. Yeah. So, so we've just got it tangential the boundary part of it is fine. So it's four for one of them, and then uh sorry, it's three 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 mm -hmm. for one of them, and then uh six for the other. Okay, okay, thanks very much. Sorry, I thought it was an easy question just to kind of get a sense of. Uh, I always get a bit confused on this with the assumption that are some number of functions of a certain variable. Well, sure. So it can only be a rule of thumb, right? And then, but I mean, they can seem to discretize it on a, on a, on a grid, then it, you, know, you, you realize it's hopeless if, if it's all the other determined, but yeah, I think that it isn't actually a. Uh, you know, they were that just yeah. Well, I mean, it makes sense to say like a method, yeah. yeah. Is it reasonable? Like that? Yeah, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so I was going to talk about some of the things that have been done in the past about this. So, uh, I mean, these are geometric English problems, so a corresponding time this is time harmonic time dependent problems. Uh, it's a traffic case, which is in some other systems of equations have been considered by like few authors. You know, this is there and others. I don't mean to leave anyone out. Uh, I think some of the things that are relevant to this. So, uh, for the isotropic case, uh, so that linearized problem considered by some fellows on 1992 in the sort of layer stripping method. Fine. Uh, but Problem of recovering the parameters at the boundary in the isotropic case uh, is essentially the same problem as this was uh, done by Rapel in 1997. And also, where the, the eliminating the real assumption to the parameters are real, it allows to be complex in 2000. And then the argument for the full jets that I call the derivatives of the parameter at the boundary is also done by Kashi and Rapel in 2000. And uh, then they do the chiral one as well, which obviously counts. So have like an extra bounce of the uh, that mixes up B and H. Chiral union. Thank you, Carl. Is Josh in the Yeah, definitely. I'm quite Okay, uh, and there's a result that to my knowledge, is the closest to, to what we have here today, which is by Kenneth Solomon Pullman, 2011, uh, which in particular covers the parameter at the boundary, but also the side as well. And but it's for the anisotropic problem where epsilon and mu are conformally related, so epsilon is a multiple. So that's the sort of thing we can talk. And there's been numerical work, but I'm not sure if it's going to be the same as this. Maybe there's some of the early work. Related to the particular method that is it, I use, that we use, uh, uh, this goes back a way. So our method analyzes the forward operator, so this lambda epsilon, as a pseudo differential operator and determines its principal symbol. And uh, this was done for the anisotropic Calderon problem by Lee and Woolman in 1989. And this method is well. Let's go to this first. It's kind of considered as applying this method in that paper to a complicated system. Uh, then the, in 
done for an elastic system, dynamic more than 1997. It's closer to ours because it's also a system. Uh, and uh, it's also the results of McDowell and Joshi that I mentioned before. Uh, it's the same determination of the principal symbol. And it's also done for harmonic differential forms, but though and Joshi is the same about that. Uh, and many others have a this is kind of a the reference that we looked at. Uh, okay, so that's all the results in kind of a review of the literature. I was going to discuss the proof, uh, how these things are proved, uh, but I don't want to go too much over time. I think I probably will. So I'll stop. Maybe if anyone's interested in, in further details about it. I, I was just going to say because because there was some numerical kind of uh, Around like the full ledges on 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 my silicon so that I mean there is a kind of connection to this formulation is the way people do it in finite elements right with edge, edge elements so uh, with edge finite elements you kind of do formulate it in this invariant way anyway right so 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 it, I mean that 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 might be kind of interesting kind of observation because. They kind of sort of rediscovered this differential form formulation when they went to finite elements. So, um, it, 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 you know, it could be that that this equation is the kind of exactly what they do to solve time harmonic problems. I mean, I know that this formulation uses some of the numerical work, like I mentioned earlier. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what they're trying to do. Anything to solve the inverse problem, right? It's uh, it's intriguing, right? That the you know the method that we used to prove prove it kind of is already the way we can formulate it numerically. It's kind of well, okay. I mean, in any case, <laughs> I mean, you can write down the I'll go over this a little bit. So um, the, these are Maxwell's equations for the middle system here. So we have the on the top and bottom the divergence equations in the middle. Like Equations. And uh, the, pro the problem, if you want to try to prove the oppositeness of this, is that it, it's not elliptic. Even if you, I mean, so it's kind of not square, so that makes sense. But even if you took only the two middle equations, it's simply not elliptic. Not an elliptic system. It's a well developed theory of elliptic systems, which you would like to apply, but uh, you have to do something to it in order to make it elliptic. And the way, one way to do that is to augment it by adding. Uh, these two things at the boundary, and I set it up this way. You can obviously order things different. And if you can add these two scalars, you do mean you make a scalar. And uh, it's like this top equation says I uh, omega of u h times u h uh, equals negative the divergence of h. I omega of u e equals negative the divergence of u h. And then the uh, e of u e is also following. So so you know, I've mentioned it this way that the things that are uh, good about it is that this is still symmetric, right? So the top one is actually uh, close. So I it may be naturally uh, anti-symmetric, but you add this i, and you do a you add this i, which makes it symmetric, <laughs> and uh, it's elliptic. So that's the thing. So the key thing is that it's elliptic, but also that it's anti-symmetric. Isn't you even magnetic the, the sort of fictitious magnetic monocles? I think it's yeah, it's kind of sort of like give H or something, but and so we kind of came up with this on our own trying to understand how to prove well pose this. But it, I believe it, I was gonna say this uh, uh at the bottom there, but I believe that we, we then looked at the reference of some of and used a similar. Even more system. <laughs> so it, it is something that's been done in the past. Um, <clears throat> and I think this is the way to do it. Okay, and so, yeah, the key thing is that the operator, so that matrix, it, it's thinking about a big matrix there as a single operator, not the symmetric with respect to the correct, correct data products. And, uh, and so you can apply it to the theory of electric systems and prove the local units. Prove that this is self adjoint and uh, that allows you to prove that uh, <coughs> local is outside of the distance. 
presumably also handy for numerical questions because we're going to see if you use my first questions to solve them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe I can also be used to, I mean, I mean, yeah. that's the more naive approach is just maybe to take a minute to sort of think in the I mean, maybe I should say as well, like when you're faced with the original system here, you essentially take the middle two and keep the square system, but and then the top and bottom are actually redundant, so the middle two imply the parallel equation to find divergent equations. But that's not the The diffeomorphism invariance, I think you're familiar. So, this is the fact that you can take a diffeomorphism that has M to M the unchanged boundary, and that allows you to get non unique equations. This is a standard thing that appears in geometric numbers. It's really based on the fact that we have the invariant formulation of the equations. Uh, and, and the diffeomorphisms, you know, as long as they fix the boundary, don't affect the thing. Contained upside view. In this way, still have the same kind of uh, <coughs> equation, and then uh, the only type of standard for components. Not possible. I think Paul's just sent a helpful link on the differential force formulation. It's unlikely. Let's see how you know. Maybe just this picture. And they. The other thing is about uh, the the determinant of G. So this is like the volume point of G in boundary normal coordinates for one of the metrics. And so you, you have to fix the coordinates to this. So this is what the boundary normal coordinates are. And you know, then would say, can you determine the volume point of of the G? Actually, can you determine anything about G? And the result is that in fact it's arbitrary. So this comes from the fact that maximum equations are independent of G. And like a version that we had, and that uh, you can choose different morphisms to change the determinant arbitrarily. Right? And this is related to trying to get go from we, we we did this because we wanted to try to go from epsilon hat and u hat and this kind of g independent parameters to epsilon and u. And so the key factor that you would need for that is the volume form of g and the control factor that's involved in that transformation. And they, yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Oh, I mean, sorry. Is it boundary? It's no more coordinates with respect to the Euclidean. No, 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 so we we'll have to pick one of the two. So there's two metrics, epsilon hat and u hat. You have to pick one of them. And then it costs you the other one's more complicated. Yeah, there's quite a lot of that in that. Uh -huh. I can go on and describe it in detail. But uh, maybe I should stop and think. But no, maybe it's no. The rest of the target, well, I have slides that give the principal symbols of the, of the operators. Okay, so maybe let's just. Throw some of what you proved then. So, the most tangential e to tangential a up to the diffeomorphism fix the bound that fixes the boundary. You can recover the tangential component. So the, right, so the, the tangential components don't depend, I mean, it always be found. Right? Yeah. They don't depend on whether I'm waiting to get the point. They stay the same when you, I guess, the thing is they stay the same when you have a diffeomorphism that fixes the boundary. Okay, so then you can find the other components. Yeah, I mean, well, these are derivatives, like all their derivatives or something. Uh, yeah, right. So that, that's a good point. So you know, the tangential components can always be determined. Then uh, if you want to talk about the non tangential components, the tangential result is here. So if we assume we know the boundary map, then we fix boundary normal coordinates for one half. <laughs> Uh, then you can either determine <laughs> the metrics as if say that they're the same, the same for two different uh, operators, boundary norm boundary operators are the same, or uh, the tangential components uh, of mu and epsilon are formally related, and uh, 
the uh, so these are the two different you find the new components and the non tangential components are related by uh, also composite. So that's the three something, the three something where something's one or two. So, so they just went like you have three J filter. Yeah, uh, means like a three one or a three two. Yeah, component. Yeah. Where three is normal. Mm -hmm. And so uh, actually, this kind of, it kind of means there's two three parameters, right? So the filter, yeah, like you said, one and two. So this means that these are like related only by this multiple C, but then the new the three. You've got two right two for C. Yeah. Uh, Actually, maybe I shouldn't say that. Yeah, like if, once C is determined here, then we if we knew what C was, we could also determine the relationship between the two relationship between the two. So I guess that one three. So so altogether, what how many functions can you find? Like, but like we start with six from you and six for X R. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so when, when we fix boundary normal coordinates, then you make it We fix boundary normal coordinates for epsilon. So that means epsilon yeah, has this particular form. Right? There's a two by two metric that gives the tangential component, and then there's a small one. So, fixing boundary normal coordinates means that epsilon is that that point. Is two by two, which is the tangential part, and then one view. Uh, so we know that there's a tangential component here. There's also actually another term which I don't remember. And then, sorry, I was trying to switch to more. No, uh, B one three. Two, three, 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 three. So you can determine the tangential components, and then there's that just uh, uh, three extra things. And so there's four tangential components here, four here, which is uh, eight. Oh, no, sorry, three and three. Six, three here, three here because it's symmetric, and then uh, three here, so nine, nine points. And um, I, I mean, that's one. Um, so how many is it? We determine uh, I just, if I just this isn't true, then we determine all the things. And then there's some cases where you can't determine one. Yeah, just like, so, so we have to do a lot of processes as we go along, but I, I suppose a lot of people just, it, is there any particular application of it that you have in mind? <laughs> I mean, we started studying it as a mathematical problem. I mean, it's kind of common now to study the problem in an isotropic case. Yeah. I mean, like if you could think of it as optical frequency, then uh, you know, there's there's cases where mu would mu would be isotropic, but epsilon would be say came from a liquid crystal or strain anisotropy or something like that. So. Um, yeah, because there are, there are materials that have this. Yeah, but so most materials you can kind of make any you know effective medium properties at that give frequency. So, um, yeah, I mean, you, one, one could make materials that have the same rotating moment that just just for fun, right? because you can now have to make the homogenization of lead metal materials or something. Like that. I, I I guess for me when I started looking at this, I was thinking of uh, liquid crystals where the epsilon is determined by the director field of the liquid crystal and uh, strain anisotropy where epsilon is related to the strain. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't really speak 
Yeah, but it, okay. So it probably does, um, you know, going back to those, it probably does prove something that we were trying to look at decades ago. Well, we don't know anything about the computer. So, So when you kind of uh, reduce the finite dimensional case by assuming that the piece went constant or something like that, you get that the exits over the things that go up Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think for the kind of the results in the boundary, everything gets done, you know, in boundary normal coordinates. So like, you take the coordinates and the little neighborhood of the boundary, and probably only really depends on the coordinates. I, I, I yeah. guess there is, there's kind of Couple of natural special cases though, where I mean, so if you take strain, strain by the fringes when they're surrounded in terms of the strain, if, if that strain field um, was only from forces at boundary, <laughs> the strain satisfies an elliptic PPE, so you've got elliptic regularity. So, you know, in some circumstances, maybe even analytic, but it doesn't make sense, right? And then the, the other one is liquid crystals, where the the rector field satisfies a, or it's non-linear, but it, the linearization is elliptic, so it's kind of got well-defined singularity. So, you know, you could at least do analytic continuation from the yes, at the boundary until you get up to the singularity. So, so it's, it's just a neat example in that, and as this new is, is usually just like isotropic, but epsilon satisfies some elliptic PEs itself, which which makes Determining something at the boundary, you, you know, more useful because you could then find something that should be you. What's wrong about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not like, like recovering at the boundary doesn't really make full recovery. Yeah, sense. so if you've got a boundary value property, so so if you have all the derivatives at the boundary, then you can set up to do it. Yeah. Thank you very much.